Tonight shall we turn to Judges, the 15th chapter, and we pick up on the story of Samson here in chapter 15. The story of Samson begins in the 13th chapter of the book of Judges with the announcement to his parents of his birth and then the birth of Samson. In chapter 14, Samson assumes a position as a judge in Israel, which position he occupied for 20 years. His falling in love with a Philistine girl in Timnath is told and the resultant disaster. As he made a riddle to the 30 young men that were appointed for his companions prior to the marriage. And he put out the riddle to them that related to his experience with a lion for on his way to Timnath, a lion jumped him. He ripped the thing in two like it was just a little goat, tossed the carcass over into the bushes, and a few weeks later, on his return trip to Timnath, walking down, he went into the bushes to see the progress of the decomposition of the lion's carcass, and he discovered that bees had made a hive in the carcass. There was honey there. And so the honey was good, he ate of it. And so to these 30 fellows that were appointed as his sort of buddies during the last week of bachelorhood, uh, he gave them a riddle with sort of a bet kind of a thing uh, that if they could tell the riddle, he would give them 30 suits and 30 shirts. If they could not tell him the riddle, then they'd have to give him 30 changes of garments plus 30 shirts. And so they said, what's the riddle? They took him on and he said, out of the eater came forth sweetness. And so they worked on it and worked on it for two or three days. They couldn't come to an answer. They came to his bride-to-be and said, look, you've set us up for this thing and we don't like it. You're trying to rip us off. That's why you called us to be this guy's companion. And now he has set up this riddle. It's a big setup. We recognize it. And you better find out what the answer to that riddle is or we're going to come and we're going to burn you and your dad's house with fire. We're going to burn you down. So she came to Samson and she said, Samson, here we're going to get married in a few days and you don't really love me. He said, what do you mean I don't love you? And she said, you haven't told me the riddle. And he said, what do you mean? I haven't told you the riddle. I haven't even told my parents the riddle. Well, you really love me. It's your, you know, we should never hide anything from each other. There should be no secrets in marriage, Samson. And what is it? You know, and she began to cry and be miserable. And so he finally said, hey, there's nothing to it. A lion jumped me and, and out of his carcass, the bees made a hive and there was honey that came out of the lion's carcass. So the day of the wedding came and uh, so the fellow said to Samson, Hey, what's stronger than a lion and what's sweeter than honey? And Samson knew that, you know, his, his bride-to-be had told it. He made him mad. And he said, if you hadn't been plowing with my heifer, you'd have never found out. And he went down to Ashkelon, another city of the Philistines, grabbed 30 Philistines, cracked their skulls and took their clothes and came back and paid off his debt. <laughs> and then took off for Eshtol, his home. He was, he was just mad. He was really hot and just took off. Didn't consummate the marriage. So that brings us up now to the 15th chapter where our lesson begins tonight. So it came to pass within a while after he cooled off 
that Samson came down to visit his wife with a little goat so that they could have some shish kebab. And so he said, I will go into my wife, into the chamber, the bedroom, but her father would not allow him to go in. And her father said, I thought that you were just, you know, completely through with her. I thought you were so angry you were never coming back. So I let her marry the best man. Now look, her younger sister is really prettier than she is anyhow. Why don't you take the younger sister? He'd already, of course, paid the dowry and everything else. And, and so he said, you know, her beautiful young sister, why don't you take her? But Samson uh, was sort of a hothead. He didn't appreciate the fact that his father-in-law had given his bride away. And so he decided to get even with the Philistines. Because they were the ones that sort of, you know, set the whole thing up anyhow, getting the secret out of his bride and they ruined this whole escapade. And so he went out and caught 300 jackals or foxes and he tied them tail to tail or just tied their tails together, two by two. And then he lit a torch and tied it to the tails of these jackals and turned them loose in the wheat fields that were ready for harvest. Now you can imagine that brown grass, wheat fields, and you can imagine the panic of the jackals. If you've ever seen a dog with a tin can on its tail, uh, you can imagine the panic of the jackals uh, with these torches on their tails running through, helter-skelter, through the wheat fields that are ripe for harvest, Golden brown just absolutely wiped out the harvest, wiped out the wheat fields, set them all on fire. They had a real prairie fire down in the area there, Timnath. And so the Philistines said, who did this? Someone said it was Samson. So they came to get him and uh, he, he wiped them all out. So he went back to a rock near Etam. And there he just went up and, and, and lay back on this rock. Well, the Philistines got together an army. And they came down against Judah. And the men of Judah said to the Philistines, Hey, what's the big idea coming down here with your armed forces? We don't want to fight. We're your servants. You've conquered us. We... we we don't want any trouble. What's your problem? And they said, look, we're not really interested in fighting you guys. If you'll just turn Samson over to us, that's all we want. We want to get that guy. So they came up to this rock where Samson was just sort of kicking back. And they said to Samson, hey, you know, you're causing us a lot of trouble, man. You know that we serve the... Philistines, and now you've gotten them all upset with us and they're down here with their army and they're threatening us. What are you doing to us? And, and they said, we want to turn you over to them. We want to bind you and, and turn you over to them. Samson said, if you will promise me that you won't turn on me yourselves, then I'll let you bind me to turn me over to them. They said, hey, we don't want to kill you. We don't have anything against you. It's they're the ones that have the grief against you. So they bound him with new ropes and they turned him over to the Philistines. And as the Philistines came upon him, God's Spirit also came upon him. And those ropes by which he was bound, he snapped them off. He saw lying there a jawbone of a donkey. He picked it up. And with the jawbone of a donkey, he began to smite the Philistines, tossing their bodies into piles until he had slain a thousand of them. 
The rest evidently fled back home. And he looked around and he said, heaps upon heaps, talking about the heaps of bodies, I've killed a thousand Philistines with a jawbone of a donkey. Well then, Samson became extremely thirsty after this exercise. <laughs> and of course, it was the month of June or so, the time of the wheat harvest, so it is very hot and very dry over there about that time of the year. And Samson actually thought he was going to die of thirst. And he said, God, you know, you've given me this tremendous victory over the, the, over the Philistines and now you're going to kill me with thirst. And so the Lord caused a thing to cleave in the jawbone of the donkey and there was water in it and he drank it and his soul was revived. And so we come, he calls the name of the place, first of all, Ramath-Lehi, which is the hill of the jawbone. Then when he got a drink out of it, he changed the name to En-Hakor, which is the well of him that cried. And he judged Israel in the time of the Philistines for 20 years. Now, that was his first encounter with the Philistines. The first problem that he faced with them. And the problem evolved out of his own going down to the city of the Philistines. Going into the camp of the enemy, he exposed himself to needless kind of desires and lusts. The Philistines were a very immoral people, very loose in their morals. Legalized prostitution and everything else was going on among the Philistines. From a fleshly standpoint, it was an exciting place to go because of the looseness of the morals. That's probably what drew him there. There in the camp of the enemy, looking for some excitement, which he found more than what he was expecting. Now his second encounter, going down again to the Philistines, and this time to the city of Gaza, which is on the south coast of the territory of the Philistines, south from Ashdod and Ashkelon. And the purpose of going to Gaza was actually to go in unto a prostitute. And the people in Gaza, the men, were told that Samson was there in town. So they circled him and they set an ambush for him. And they locked the gates of the city and they said, we'll wait until morning and when he goes to leave town, we'll pounce on him and we'll kill him. Samson stayed with this gal until midnight and decided to go home. And coming to the gates of the city, he found them locked and barred. So he picked up the doors of the gate of the city with the two posts and he went away with them, bars and all, put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. Now Hebron's about 25 miles from Gaza. So he carried these gates all the way to Hebron or to a hill before Hebron, 20 miles away. Tossed them over. And, of course, in the morning, the men from Gaza had to send out a regiment to get their gates back. <laughs> and again, going into the territory of the enemy, setting himself up. You can play with fire, but ultimately you're going to get burned. 
Sometimes when a person is successful in a sense in playing around with his passions, he thinks that he can master the situations. He thinks he's getting by with it. But ultimately, it's going to catch you. And thus, it came to pass that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorak, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came to her and she, they said unto her, Entice him. Find out where his great strength lies. And by what means we might prevail against him. And we will give thee, every one of us, eleven hundred pieces of silver. So they, all of them, offered this enormous bribe to her if she would discover the secret of this fellow's strength. So Delilah said plain out to him, Hey, tell me, what is the secret? Where is it that your great strength lies? Samson said, well, if they would bind me with green vines that have never been dried, then I would be weak just like any other man. So, she began to, you know, run her fingers through his hair, that kind of stuff, and Pretty soon he fell off to sleep and she commanded the Philistines to come in with green vines never dried and they bound him up. And she said, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he jumped up and these things snapped off like they were threads that were burned in a fire. And he cracked the skulls of the Philistines. <laughs> and she said, you lied to me. That isn't really true. You weren't weak like other men. Tell me. Don't lie to me. Tell me, what is the secret of your strength? Where does your great strength lie? And he said, well, the mistake people have made is they've never bound me with new ropes. Now, if you would bind me with new ropes, then I would be weak, just like any other man. So again, she soothed him off to sleep and ordered the Philistines to bind him with these new ropes. Never been used for any other purpose. And then she said, Samson, the Philistines be upon thee. And he jumped up and these ropes snapped off and again busted their skulls. She said, oh, you lied to me again. <laughs> Tell me, Samson, come on. I want the truth this time. What is the secret of your strength? And Samson said, well, if you would braid my hair in seven braids, then I'd be weak just like anybody else. Now, at this point, you may be thinking, good, Samson, you're not revealing the truth. Keep her guessing. But in reality, Samson is guilty of a compromise which is always dangerous. When she said, what is the secret of your strength? He should have flat out said, it's none of your business. I'll never tell. But he's playing games. Thinking that he is clever. But notice he's getting closer to the truth. 
He's wearing down. He's talking now about his hair. There are times when people have made a special commitment of their life to God. Maybe at a retreat. Maybe just at a time where God has really spoken in their heart and they've responded and they've made their determination, I'm going to really live my life now for God. And the phone rings. And it's one of their friends. And they say, come on over tonight. We're going to have a party. Someone's got a keg, you know. And we're going to have a good time. Now, this is the life you said, hey, I'm not going to do that anymore. I know that that life is the life of folly. I'm not going to enter that anymore. And, and I'm going to live for Christ. And you've made that commitment within your heart. But now, here is the invitation. And you say, oh, thanks. I, I really appreciate you calling me, but I don't feel so good tonight. I think I'm going to go to bed early. And they say, oh, that's too bad. We're going to really have a blast, you know. And you think, wow, all right, chalk one up for victory, you know. I didn't go. But wait a minute. You weren't totally honest either. And what you have actually done is left the door open for another invitation. Now, if when they called and said, hey, come on over tonight, we've got a cave, we're going to have a great time, you know. If you had said, I appreciate you calling, but I have committed my life to Jesus Christ and I'm not going to be doing any of that stuff anymore. I'm going to just be living for the Lord because that's the only way to live. Man, the time of the end is close and I'm just going to really get it on for the Lord. No, no, no more of that stuff for me. They'd never call you again. <laughs> You see, now you're being honest. You're being true. You're closing the door which we need to do on evil. We need to close the door on evil. We're not always doing that. A lot of times we're leaving the door open. Little excuses. So that the door is still open. This was Samson's problem. He was leaving the door open but he is weakening. He's breaking down. And so again, she caused him to go to sleep. And she braided his hair into seven locks. And for good measure, they took spikes and pinned them to the planks of the floor. And then she said, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he jumped up and pulled the planks of the floor up with him and went out and took care of them. Now women know when everything else fails. <laughs> Try the tear route. And so Delilah began to turn on the tears. You've been deceiving me. You don't really love me. You've just been playing games with me. You don't really love me. You know, you're just making a fool out of me. Tell me, Samson. And she began to press him daily, making it miserable for him. And so finally, Samson said, Look, all my life, I've been a Nazarite unto God. There it is. That was the secret of his strength. The word Nazarite is separated. All of my life I've been separated unto God. The strength of Samson lay in his commitment of his life to God, which was done really before his birth. For before Samson was ever born, 
the angel of the Lord in announcing to his mother the fact that she was to have a son, told her never to bring a razor to his head, never to allow him to have anything from the vine, wine or whatever, because he was to be a Nazarite from his birth unto God, separated unto God from his birth. Now, in Numbers, the sixth chapter, you have the law for the Nazarite. There were many times when a person wanted to have a special dedication of his life to God for a period of time. It's more or less as the traditional Lent period today. Where people, you know, make sort of a commitment prior to Easter and, and, and sacrifice or give up something for the Lent period. Well, the, in Israel, they, they did the same kind of a thing in, in a period and usually before their feast days, the, the holy days of their feast, uh, they, would, they would take a vow and separate their lives unto God. And according to the sixth chapter of Numbers, if you wanted to separate your life and take the vows of a Nazarite, you were to bring no razor to your head. And you were not to drink any wine, any vinegar uh, made from grapes, any uh, strong drink coming from grapes. You were not to drink any nectar or grape juice. Nor were you to eat any grapes themselves, nor raisins. Nor anything that came from the grapevine. Now, the reason for that, I don't know. But it was just a, a kind of a self-denial. Uh, raisins were one of the, the real delicacies in those days. They did not have canning processes or uh, freezing of food and all in those days. So, in the summertime, they would dry their fruits. And all winter long, they would eat dried fruits. Or, uh, you know, they can take and cook up the ap dried apricots with some water and they have apricots. But they, they did not have any canning processes, so the preserving process was always that of drying the fruit. So raisins were really a delicacy. It's something they, it, was a, it was something that they always had and enjoyed. And so it's sort of a denial in order to make this consecration unto God for a period of time. And then when you came to the end of, the, of that time that you have set for your consecration, then you shave all of your hair and you bring it and offer it as a burnt offering unto God. It was just a sacrifice thing and you'd, you know, it was just the sacrifice. And Numbers, the sixth chapter, tells of the vows of a Nazarite. Now, his was not to be a separation for a period of time. It was to be a lifelong commitment and separation of his life to God, a lifelong type of a consecration or commitment. And that was the secret of his strength. I have been a Nazarite unto God. I've been separated unto God. And therein his great strength did lie. That separation unto God, or that Nazarite vow was indicated by his hair having never been cut. And so he tells her, I've been a Nazarite unto God, there's never been a razor come to my head. If I would break that vow, if I would shave my head, the vow would be broken, it would be over then I would be just like any other man. He told her all that was in his heart. He laid his heart open before her. And it said that Delilah knew that this time he actually laid his heart open. He told her the truth. And so she went out to the lords of the Philistines and said, we've got him. And so they all gathered together. And again, she relaxed him so he could go to sleep. 
You think, oh, that poor, stupid oaf. (laughs) You'd think that the guy would know better. You know, after all, she's done everything he said so far. He said, tie me with new green vines, tie me with new ropes, braid my hair, and she's done the whole thing. He ought to know that she's going to do it. You'd think that he'd get out of there. Paul said to Timothy to flee youthful lust, which damn men's souls in perdition. Samson, sort of bolstered by the victories of the past, having become self-confident over the past power, went to sleep. Now you hear so often that Delilah cut off his hair. No, she didn't. She called a barber. And while he was sleeping there on her lap, the barber shaved his head. And so she woke him up. She said, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he jumped up and he said, I'll shake myself as times before. And he knew not that the Lord had departed from him. As we move on in the Old Testament, we're going to come to an interesting king by the name of Asa, who at the beginning of his reign was facing a huge invading army of Ethiopians and Nubians. And he called upon the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel. And as he was coming back from victory over this huge army, the prophet of God came out to Asa and said, The Lord is with you while you'll be with Him. But if you forsake Him, He will forsake you. The Lord was with Samson as long as he kept that vow, even though he wasn't always doing the right thing even though there was tremendous weakness in his own moral character, even though he was guilty of doing foolish things, yet the Lord didn't desert him until he deserted the Lord. Until the vow was broken. But at this point, he had strayed so far that he didn't even know that the Lord had departed from him. Now, there is a spiritual kind of a blindness that afflicts people. Especially if you are fooling around in the enemy's territory, trying to play around with sin, playing games on the enemy's field, it is possible for you to stray from God and to get out more or less isolated and away from God. So caught up in your activities that you're not really aware of the fact that that anointing, that power of God is no longer upon your life. Now there are many people who assume because the anointing of God is still upon their life, that God must be pleased with all that they are doing. That is a wrong conclusion. God does not immediately elift His anointing from a person's life. 
because they have failed or they have fallen. I've heard so many people use the rationale, but God still uses us. And, and thus they, they take the fact that God is still using them as, the, as, as sort of a God is approving what we are doing. If God wasn't approving what we were doing, then He would take His anointing and take His power from our lives. That isn't always true. It's a wrong rationale. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. But if you continue in that path, you're going to get one day to the place where God's Spirit is removed from your life. You won't know it maybe for a time. You'll still be going on in the same old thing, but you'll not be seeing the effects and the results anymore. He was blind to his own spiritual state. It is possible to be self-deceived about your own spiritual state. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth isn't in us. And there are a lot of self-deluded people as regarding to their own spiritual condition. Samson was blind to the truth about his own spiritual condition. He knew not that the Lord had departed from him. But because the Lord had departed from him, he was weak just like any other man. And this man who at one time had slain a thousand of the Philistines with the unlikely weapon of a jawbone of a donkey is now held down by just a few of them. As one brings a stick and gouges out his eyes, while others grab him and bind him with chains of brass. And they lead him off to Gaza to put him in the prison where he is now grinding. In those days, they had their mills with a giant millstone. Some of them weighing several hundred pounds. And they would take these stones and lay them and carve into the stones little grooves around in a circle. And they would have a, a stone in the center of the circle with a hole that they had made in the top that would pivot around and around. And then they would have this giant round millstone that rolled around in this groove all the way around and a post going through it and they would take an ox as a rule or a donkey and they would harness it to this post so that the ox or donkey would just continue walking round and round in the circle as it would pull this millstone around and the ladies would come and pour out their uh, corn or their wheat or their barley into the little groove, and as the millstone would roll over it, uh, it would grind their wheat into flour. And this was usually uh, the work of an ox or a donkey pushing this pole around to push the millstone around to grind the flour. It now became the occupation of Samson. In my lifetime, I've had some very boring jobs. One summer on the Irvine Ranch, I piled beans. You ever piled beans all day? It has to be one of the most boring jobs in the world. You just walk up this row of, of beans and, you know, you take your pitchfork and you just go along and then you make a pile. And, you, you know, you just go. And it is boring. And you wait for lunchtime. But lunch is so far coming. And then you'll wait for evening so you can get off work. 
I picked tomatoes for Tewinkle over here in Costa Mesa on the bluffs when the whole area of Dover Shores used to be tomato fields. And picking tomatoes is a boring job. You know, you get a bunch of guys out there and of course you end up usually in tomato fights and <laughs> time goes a little faster, but it is just a boring job. There's no challenge to it. Days seem like months. Can you imagine how boring it would be if all day long you were just pushing this pole around in a circle? That would have to be a miserable life. No longer can you even see. You're now forced totally within yourself. And you have really nothing to look forward to. This was the condition of Samson. And so they put out his eyes. They bound him with fetters of brass. And he did grind in the prison house. I would like to suggest that this is perhaps one of the most colorful pictures of the effect of giving yourselves over to unbridled lust, living in sin. Its ultimate effect upon you is blinding you to the truths of God to the realities of God. Secondly, its effect is binding you by its power. You find yourself in the situation no longer able to get out. You're bound. You began it as a lark. You began it as an excitement. You began it for thrills, for kicks. But in time... It got its hold upon you. And now you continue to do it, though the kicks are no longer there, but you can't get rid of it. You can't quit it. You find yourself bound by the power of sin. And then it becomes a grind. You begin to hate yourself. You begin to hate what you're doing but you have no way out. You can't escape from it and you get into that grind and your life becomes miserable. Your life becomes hopeless. You see no sense of trying to go on and you're living in misery as it's beginning now to grind away. So Samson, an apt picture of the effects of sin, unbridled lust, in a person's life. How be it, the Scripture tells us, the hair of his head began to grow again after they had shaved him. Therein I see the marvelous grace of God. Samson have blown it. He had the potentials of greatness. He had the potential of delivering God's people out of the hands of their enemies. Samson had the potential of going down in the history book as one of the mightiest and most glorious of all of the deliverers of Israel. His name could have been alongside of David's and Samuel's. He's a marvelous deliverer of Israel. But he could not conquer his own passions, his own lust. And thus there he is, blinded, 
bound, grinding. Howbeit, the hair of his head began to grow again. Therein is the gospel. Because all of us have sinned. All of us have come short of the glory of God. All of us have failed God. All of us have found ourselves trapped. Thinking that there's no way out. But God is gracious and even though we have failed Him, He will not fail us. And even though we have forsaken Him, if we will just turn back unto Him, He will be merciful and gracious. On a boring job, there's plenty of time to think. And I imagine that Samson did a lot of thinking as he was pushing that post around. Thinking of what a fool he had been. Going back and reliving the mistakes and thinking, if I'd only done this, if I'd only done that, if I'd only stayed out of Sorek, If I'd only walked away from Delilah. If I'd only, if I'd only, and living in those reflections of the past. A man, once mighty and powerful, now shuffling with uncertain gait because he can't even see where he's going anymore. Brought down to the bottom. But many times God has to bring us to the bottom so we'll look up. And he began to look up. And I'm certain that as his hair began to grow again, he felt within his heart, God, I'm going to renew my consecration. I'm going to renew my vow. But God, what can you do with me now? Lord, what I have and what's left here is yours. I'm going to give my life to you such as it is. Never can he achieve or attain what he could have, the full potential of his being. But Lord, at least you can have what's left. The broken shell. And so the Philistines were having a huge gala party. They had gathered in the temple of their god, the god Dagon. People were on the roof, crowded around the place. Someone got the brilliant idea. Let's bring that guy Samson. They used to give us such a bad time. Bring him into the arena so we can see him shuffling around in his blinded condition. Let him stumble around, trip him and all, and and just so we can have a big laugh at the clumsiness of him now that he cannot see. And so they hurried down to the prison and they brought Samson from the prison into the temple and as he came in, the laughs and the hurrahs went up as the people began to mock him and to jeer him, to make fun of him as he tried to make his way around the room in a strange place, not able to see. One would put his foot out in front of Samson and Samson would trip and fall and everybody would roar and howl with laughter. That man who was such a nemesis is now so weakened. And it delighted them. And Samson said, Oh God, once more, just once more, God, all I ask is once more, let the anointing of your Spirit come upon my life. David, the psalmist, 
messing around, also lost that sense of God's Spirit. After his sin with Bathsheba, and after the death of his child, David repented and his repentance is given to us in the 51st Psalm. And one of the pertinent prayers of David in the 51st Psalm when he is asking God to cleanse him and according to God's mercy blot out his transgression. One of the pertinent verses there he said, And return thy Holy Spirit unto me. Oh God, again, let me sense your presence. Let me again sense your power. And this was Samson's prayer. Lord, once more, I want to know your power on my life. And Lord, I don't want to live. I have nothing to live for now. Let me die with the Philistines. His prayer unto God. He said to the young boy that was leading him around, take me over to the pillars that hold this place up. And the little boy innocently led him over to the pillars that held up the temple. And he took hold in his right arm and left arm, the two key pillars holding up the building. He said, God, I want the Philistines to be avenged for the eyes that they put out. And by faith he began to pull and the Spirit of God came upon Samson and he pulled those pillars together. The temple of the god Dagon fell with the Philistines packed into it and 3,000 of them were crushed to death. And Samson lay dead under the crushed Philistines. God's grace allowed him to once more experience the power of God. And he went out in the greatest victory of his life. Jesus in the New Testament said something that was very interesting in, in regards to his disciples. He said, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor... It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of man. Samson probably is a good illustration of, of this sort of allegory of Jesus. For God had chosen Samson to be the saving salt of Israel. But because of the weakness of his flesh, he lost his savor and he ended up crushed neath the Philistines. The sad story of Samson is being repeated, however, over and over as we see men with wasted potentials. God has endowed people with talents, abilities, and they waste them because of the weaknesses of their own flesh. They never achieve, they never attain that full glory and power that God wants their lives to be. Wasted potential is the story of so many people. The tragic biography. Wasted. His life was wasted. He could have done so much for God. He could have been such a power for God's kingdom. He could have been so influential in bringing others to the Lord, but his life was wasted. He was destroyed by the weakness of his own flesh. 